what the hell the media is going to do. I don't come back off this and say, boy, I wonder what the press will do. I honestly, the best of my ability to recall, have never shot anybody. I've got to coach the game. I don't give a damn what they do. I've got to coach the game. And, and I mean, I, I've never really hit anybody with a bat. I just say, damn it, that's not right. So here uh, is the last question. What is the truth about Bob Knight? I don't want to answer. Good evening, everybody. I'm Roy Firestone, and this is Up Close Prime Time. Tonight, coming to you from Assembly Hall, the home of the five-time NCAA basketball champs, Indiana. It's also a place that might aptly be called Night Court, because for the last 25 years, it's the place where Robert Montgomery Knight held court, where he coached his highest highs and had some of his lowest lows. Tonight, Up Close Prime Time, with the man, the passion, the fury, the glory. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Bobby Knight, up close prime time. Oh, Jesus Christ! How long do you stay there? You got a two second count. I don't care whether they get you the ball, don't get you the ball, kick the son of a bitch up in the stand. You got a two count. Then get your ass out of there. Welcome to night school. It's a far cry from Father Flanagan here. At Indiana University, the professor is teaching with a hard edge, and only the strong survive. You are capable you are of learning something. Damn, that's a revelation. Does it concern you that because of the reputation, the image, the stereotype, whatever you want to call it, that kids are of the 90s, today's 90s kid who wants to be the man, I want to be the man when I come to school here, I can't be the man with night, so I'm going to go somewhere. You're going to lose some of these blue chip athletes. Well, we always are. There are always reasons why we're not going to be able to recruit everybody. And we have never, and I have never thought, that we were for everybody. You know, a kid may say to me, well, I want freedom in my game. I said, you got to keep in mind that we had Isaiah Thomas playing here. And if he's not smart enough to understand that, then he's not smart enough to come to Indiana. Did you ever think about coming out and getting a hand on the He's an odd mixture of old-school values and street-tough justice. His temper is swift and fierce. His problems have often come with his honesty, even at West Point, where it still galls Bob Knight that he was viewed as too tough. When I coached at West Point, I had problems with, with, uh, with people on the, uh, on the staff at West Point, either as uh, uh, in the military department or in the academic department because I would get on players, you know, oh, he shouldn't be on cadets. I mean, what the hell? I mean, should the Army basketball team be the toughest, damnedest, fightingest team that ever played, that when we play in Madison Square Garden, that they're knocking over bleachers, they're knocking over the scores table, they're knocking over officials, they're going after loose balls. That's, I'm sitting in the stands, and I'm saying, hey, if the Army is in the hands of those guys, we're in pretty good shape. I love what I'm seeing there, but yet, when I was at West Point, people, he's too tough on the cadets. He, yeah. He well, shouldn't, and, you know, They still I, say it. I mean, come on, he berates the guy. How many times are you going to call a kid an ass? Well, well, and they well, stop. Well, 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 I don't ever call a kid a name. I say we play like jackasses. You know, you never we, called an, we, athlete, an athlete a name. Come on. I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, I, I, I say, hey. Playing like that. We got to be the dumbest son of a that that ever played. Here's one of the things I've heard. Don't listen to Knight when he calls you a jackass, but listen to him when he tells you why you're a jackass. Does that sound close to right? Does that, does that make sense to you? I, I think that, that um, uh, a kid that, that I'm going to coach, you see, I care enough about you as a player to tell you when you're screwing up. I'm not going to pat you on the back. I, I want you to know. I want you to know that you can be better than that. I want to know that I have higher expectations for you than that. I want, to, want you to know that I feel you can be better than you are right now. You have said, I have a higher regard for you than you, than have, you have for, for yourself. yourself. It's a pretty, pretty grand statement there. Well, I think I You really believe that? Absolutely. He's as demanding on the system as he is on his own players. Uh, this Monday night television is just absolute uh, if the people in this conference uh, can't think 
uh, enough of these kids to get them in a situation where they miss as little class as possible. Wisconsin is going to get to bed tonight. Uh, those kids aren't going to sleep. They got to get up and go to Michigan to play a game on Wednesday. Uh, nothing could be more unfair than that. It's time to get the presidents or somebody stepped in and laid some rules down on when these teams can play and when they can't and how much class they're allowed to miss and the hell with ESPN or whatever it is getting on television because this is an absolute ridiculous thing to put a college student through. Now I'm going to go home. Anybody got a question? Good. Knight won't back down when education suffers and he won't back down when he feels the system softens his men. Now there's a turn being made to go back to demands and be more demanding and that education has to be more demanding of students. A failure of positive reinforcement in American education that everything Johnny does is okay. You know, Johnny, now I know you've missed seven shots in a row, but don't let that bother you. When you see the eighth one, just shoot it, Johnny. I'd like to say, John, you know you've missed two shots now, bad shots. You take another one, I'm going to strangle you. I mean, that's kind of my approach. You know, at the time when I was in college, I was a teenager. And, you know, when you're a teenager at, you know, 18, 17, 19, you think you know it all and can't nobody tell you anything. And had it not been for him being the type of coach and person that he was, then there's no way in hell I would be having this much success that I'm having after basketball. Yeah, he was a great teacher in terms of basketball, but he was a greater teacher in terms of preparing you for life. What I try to make a difference with is this team right here, and that's what I decided. I said, I'm going to try and do everything I can to let kids see Indiana play hard, to, to let them see that we demand that they play hard, win or lose, that, that, that we expect them to do things, that they're expected to go to class, that if they're going to be here for four, we've had, uh, in 26 years, we've only had two kids that have played four years that haven't graduated. And that's what I want kids to see. I, I want to coach. I don't want to be a warden. Is that why you couldn't coach in the NBA, really? You wouldn't want to coach in the NBA. Well, Babysitter, warden, whatever you want to call Two it. reasons. I don't want to be involved in that many games. I, I really don't. I don't want to travel like that. I don't want to be involved in all of those games. And I have yet to see uh, a team where a really good coach wasn't more valuable than any player on the team. But that's not the way it exactly. is. Exactly, and that's why I've always looked at it in, in that vein. But it's beginning to creep into the college game, too. Kids have got to play. Right. they got to get no, their play in right. time. they got to get this. Where's my pub? Where's this? What kind of shoe thing? And, you know, oh, by the way, you're only going to have me for two years, so you better use me right. You know, the next thing you know, the coach is, is, is an underling to the player. It's happened. Well, and it's it, happening everywhere you look. It ain't going to happen here. <laughs> When we return, the dark side of nights, as up close prime time continues. Who the hell told you I wasn't going to be here? I'd like to know. Do you have any idea who it was? Up close. The blind rage. It's sudden and swift, impulsive and terrifying. In his explosive drive to succeed, Bob Knight has a dark and furious temper that has served to embarrass and undermine his reputation. Look at here, look at here. Bobby Knight just threw his chair. Chair across the free throw lane. What's the lowest you felt? Was it the chair? Was it... Oh, no, hell no. Why would I? I mean, guy makes a, makes a bad call, makes another bad call. I throw a chair across the floor. What the hell did that hurt? I mean, how many coaches have you seen throw down clipboards, kick over bleachers, or well, managers down throwing bats, baskets, I've seen managers throw bats. I mean, what the hell is throwing a chair? I think that's the most overrated thing that's ever happened. Yeah, well, what if that chair had hit some kid and busted his knee? Sure, or... but it didn't, did it? Because I threw it exactly where nobody was. No. These are the images we see over bad boy Bob. But I don't create those. Somebody else makes an issue out of that, not me. Wilkerson wasn't okay. expecting it. I don't know if he slipped or not. His famous headbutt incident was accidental, he insists. I'm Sharon Wilkinson. You're coming out after a timeout. He's made a bonehead play. He's sitting here. The video, it looks like you're headbutting him. Tell us what happened. I, I can hardly stand or sit. I had a terrible problem with my back. Wilkerson 
has taken a three-point shot, as I recall, where he, it was not a good shot, and I took him out. I came down to say something to him about it. It's really hard for me to bend down. Now, you sit as though you're a player. You know, well, you're not going to be. Most players are going to be here, kind of. Exactly. Like okay. As I go down and I go to say something, I try. I, le I hit Wilkerson in the head. I don't even give this a thought. You have no right to do what you did, and I'm going to report it to the NCAA because right. it's horseshit. His temper has cost him in image and in pocketbook. Like when he was fined thirty thousand dollars for a blistering attack on an NCAA media rep during the tournament last year. You know, you only got two people that are going to tell you I'm not going to be here. One is our SID, and the other is me. Who the hell told you I wasn't going to be here? I'd like to know. Do you have any idea who it was? Yeah, I do, Coach. Who? I'll point them out to you in a while. They were from Indiana, right? No, they're not. No, from weren't from Indiana, and you didn't no. get it from anybody from Indiana, did you? Could we please it? No, I'll, do, I'll handle this the way I want to handle it now that I'm here. You <laughs> it up to begin with. Now, just sit there or leave. I don't give a what you do. Now, back to the game. Let me tell you what happened there, and, and, and this uh, will forever separate me from the people who are on the NCAA tournament committee because I thought they were the most chicken people that I've ever dealt with in my life after this. When we got there, the guy had already announced that I wouldn't be coming, uh, and, and the Missouri players were already up. The guy that had said uh, Knight will not be attending the press conference uh, made all the guy had to do was just say, hey, I made a mistake on this, and Coach Knight's been waiting back here for 25 minutes. And that had been fine. I, that's all I needed. All right, so I get started, and with him not saying anything, I just burned slowly to the point where I turned around, and I said, run that by me one more time about how you were told I wouldn't be here for this press conference. And his answer was, let's just get this over with. And I said, wait a minute, you're the guy that this up, not me. And with that, I turned around and went ahead with the press conference. Now, if that's, you know, I didn't it up. Uh, it was the NCAA tournament committee's man that's there. But they fine you, what, 30 grand? $30,000. I mean, I, I could have gone out and, and uh, killed, pillaged, uh, sold drugs, uh, and uh, broken windows for about $2,000. Knight was once found guilty of assaulting a Puerto Rican police officer in the 1979 Pan American Games. But that too, he says, was a distortion of the truth. Did you ever hit Jose Silva at the Pan American Games, the cop in Puerto Rico? Did you hit him? Mike Shazewski was in an argument with the guy. I went up, imagine me as the pacifier. <laughs> I went up and I said, Mike, I said, let me take care of this. And the guy turns to me and is shaking his hand in my face. He hits me right here harder than that. When he does that, he hits me here, I turn down. No, I'm about as close as I am to you. I turn away and I reach my hand up until I feel his face. Mm -hmm. Feel his face, not smack it. Mm -hmm. Feel it and just push him away from me and step back. And it had you punching a Puerto Rican police officer. When he showed this in court, he took about two steps away from the imaginary target demonstrating what I did takes two steps and throws a roundhouse punch. I turn to the judge and I say, I weigh 235 pounds. He weighs 160. If he doesn't have a mark on him, then I have to be the worst puncher in the history of the world. <laughs> the maximum sentence was six months. They gave me nine months. Oh, I was a... The maximum fine was $500, and I think they gave me $1,000. This is in absentia. No, that's exactly what happened. Yet he cannot dispute his lack of tact and boorishness when it comes to the media. When my time on earth is gone and my activities here are past, I want they bury me upside down and my critics can kiss my ass. Listen to Knight going off. Why did he have to say in front of adults and women and some children growing up? There's the coach at Indiana University saying that. But you know, let me tell you something that uh, I don't talk about very often. But uh, I'll tell you, I never walk through an airport, ever, that somebody doesn't come up to me, old, young, male, female, and say, Coach, I like the way you do things. 
If they had a picture of Mike Krzyzewski on the sideline, they'd probably have him like this. Occasionally, they might have him yelling. But with you, they wait for the picture of you doing this or this or grabbing the gun. In other words, they want the stereotype. They want that picture. Sure, I, Why perpetuate it is what I'm asking. I understand that. But do you think that, that I can sit there and coach for 40 minutes like this? <laughs> I mean, I, that's not me. And the person that I feel that I owe it most to be honest with is me. And, and if I'm honest with me, and that may not be right, but if I'm honest with me, then uh, Abraham Lincoln once said that when it comes time for me to give up the reins of this administration, mm -hmm. if I have but one friend left and that friend resides deep within me, then I'll be satisfied. When we come back, the side you never see of the coach, Bobby Knight. Uh, it's a side of Coach Knight that, you know, people just don't understand. And uh, again, Isaiah Thomas, when it comes down, Indiana will be champion. On the day Indiana won its second national championship, a Bloomington, Indiana newspaper ran that headline larger than the headline for the story of the attempted assassination of President Reagan. Indiana basketball. It's bigger than any one man, it seems. But beyond the Red Sea of title banners, the trophies, the tradition, the band, there is something here that doesn't get the press, and it too is very big. It's Bob Knight's heart. Bob Knight will literally take money out of his pocket and give it to someone if he thinks they need it. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of person he is on his good side. Mm -hmm. And so that the people who stand by him do so with very good reason. You, you have a tendency to turn to people that have a certain strength and that you know have that strength, and Knight was one of those. Wayne Lucas is the world's most successful horse trainer. He's also Bob Knight's friend. When Lucas's son Jeff was near death after being trampled by a horse, it was Bob Knight who responded in the crisis, and Lucas will never forget it. Jeff was in a coma for 32 or three days. Um, actually, uh, life support stopped on two different occasions. Things were very, very tough. Knight called. He called when it happened. He called every day, even after, long after it looked like it, things were going to be okay. Jeff was in rehab, and uh, it, we knew that uh, A, he wasn't going to lose his life. B, he would come back to some level of proficiency in his uh, motor skills and mental skills and so forth. Uh, I never, I could never call Bob. I wanted to talk Indiana basketball. I wanted to share uh, my thoughts on basketball. He does, he, the basketball was secondary to my uh, concern for, for Jeff. Always, how's Jeff? How's the therapy going? What is he doing? How far along is he? But always, always Jeff first. It doesn't surprise you but it surprises just about everybody else. This guy, this ogre, has a heart and compassion and sentiment? Well, I don't think anybody that knows him ever felt that way. The people that I really care about like me. Why do I need anything more than that? It's Bob Knight who's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the school library. Bob Knight who employs deaf kids to be his team's managers. And when Landon Turner, one of Knight's top players, was paralyzed in an automobile accident, it was Knight who raised the money to pay his medical bills and set up an endowment for his future. That would have been enough, but then Knight did something more. I once said to Red Auerbach after Landon Turner had been in the automobile accident, tell you, this is all anybody ever needs to hear about Red Auerbach. Um, I said, Red, it would be great if the Celtics drafted Landon Turner. Bobby said, uh, what do you think about uh, having him it was a dream that he played for the Celtics. Well, I said, gee, that's great, great. Right away, I jumped at But we not only drafted him, we sent him a watch, you know, a championship watch, and we uh, sent him uniforms, and we did that. We made him uh, feel real good uh, about it. It made us feel good. Nineteen days later at the NBA draft, when uh, uh, Larry O'Brien was still the commissioner, they went through the draft, and Larry got up and said, now, does anybody else have a selection? And Red stood and said, the Boston Celtics take Landon Turner. And I'm not sure that I've ever had anybody do anything that meant as much to me as Red doing that or meant as much to a kid that I've had anything to do with as the Celtics taking Landon Turner. That's Red Auerbach. 
Now, I'm not trying to push it here, but uh, that voice dropped just a second. Well, it meant a lot to me. His players mean more to him than almost anybody, and nobody more than Quinn Buckner. The, one of the reasons I came to Indiana was I can recall very distinctly my father saying to me after Coach Knight left, you want to play for that man because he won't lie to you. He's honest. He said, that's a rare commodity out here in, in today's world. I remember, my dad's been dead 10 years. That thing happened 25 years ago, and I remember that to this day, and Coach has, has never lied to me. After Quinn Buckner got canned or was cut, waived from the NBA, and nobody really wanted him, he picked up the phone and called Quinn Buckner and said, it would really mean a lot to me for you to sit on our bench. Quinn Buckner sat on that bench the night, spoke to the team, team won the game, and after the game, Quinn Buckner, who was really down on his luck and really depressed, went into that locker room, and the first thing he said is, we've never given a game ball out here at IU. It'd be kind of nice to give one to Quinn Buckner tonight. He's meant everything to IU. And then uh, your voice got choked with emotion, and you walked out. And then his, his voice got choked with emotion, he walked out. That's about the nicest thing I've ever heard a coach do for a player, even a former player. Yeah, but I didn't let him talk about shooting that night. <laughs> Mike Krzyzewski was Knight's captain at West Point when Bob coached there. And there, too, Knight stood tall. And my dad passed away when I was a senior at West Point. And uh, when he did, I was captain of the basketball team. We just beaten Navy and getting ready to go on a, a two-game trip. And all of a sudden, he died. I mean, I was devastated. And Coach Knight flew out to Chicago and spent three days with my family mm -hmm. and uh, made my mom feel like at ease. And he just told me, you don't have to come back. Uh, just stay with your mom. But I did come back, and we won. And, we went to the NIT, and uh, it's a side of Coach Knight that, you know, people just don't understand, and, uh, again, commitment. Why but, do you keep people at a distance but, when you're doing a good thing? But why don't people know this? That's why why should they? I mean, that's between Because they the, should. They shouldn't. That's nobody's business but mine. If I want to do something, that's between uh, me and, and the people. But, but shouldn't they know the whole story no, about it's you? it's none of their business. Why? But in this case, let's get back to this case. Why wouldn't I? I mean, it didn't make any difference. Mike was our captain. It didn't make any difference if it had been a kid that, that wasn't playing at all. I, I think that's what a coach's responsibility is. The story is Mike's. I think the, the, the story is uh, a kid that loses his dad. Uh, you know, the only thing that could mean more to a kid is to lose his mom. And, and he loses his dad, but he has a team. He has teammates. He has a responsibility to them. And he comes back and he really fulfills that responsibility. To me, that's the story of that way. But a big part of the story is his coach was there for him when it mattered. Wait, when it mattered more than anything else but, in the world, Bob, when it mattered more than anything else in the world, you were there. And but, I can't say that every, about every coach. But, but I think that's where I should have been. Some say Knight should have been anywhere but all over a player's back. Michael Brooks never made it to the pros, but a lesson from Coach Knight is something he'll always remember. I sat with Brooks right over there in the first row after we'd played a, an exhibition game down in Lexington uh, against former Kentucky players on a Friday night. And I said, Brooks, let me tell you something. I said, you're a 110 to 108 player. You're going to make enough mistakes that the guy that has the ball at the end of the game is going to win. I said, you've got no game. I mean, you throw it, you shoot it. Uh, if you make a bad pass, that's part of the game. You take a bad shot, that's part of the game. I said, you've got, a, you've got no game, Michael. You have no idea what the hell this is all about. And I used a lot of other adjectives in this discourse with Michael mm -hmm. sitting over there. And I said, now go shoot free throw. I'm sitting at the scorer's table, and, and I had four kids in for half-hour sessions that morning. It was a Saturday morning. And Brooks' group was the last group. And so when Mike gets done shooting free throws, he came over to me and, and he looked down at me and, and I can still, I can close my eyes and look up and I can see Brooks standing there. And he says, uh, coach, and I'm thinking, well, what's this going to be? He said, nobody in my life, and I'm 21 years old, has ever talked to me like you just did. And I just want to say thanks. He walked into the locker room. I'm not really sure the Almighty cares about what you say. I think he cares about what you do. When we return, more with the indomitable Bobby Knight. What is the deal with 
here you got you got a gun you got this defenseless animal 500 yards away sometimes you have a telescopic sight you can nail those suckers i mean come on you you want to be fair you want to be competitive bob knight cuts an imposing figure with his hunting gear and shotgun but spend some leisure time with him like we did and you'll see that the night moves here are good-natured and dare we say even gentle i don't own a rifle uh-huh and uh i couldn't shoot a deer uh, i couldn't shoot a, an elk i've never had any interest uh, huh. in hunting big animals because you feel sorry for the animal no i, I think they're beautiful they're, I, when i'm out fishing or hunting i enjoy seeing deer mm -hmm. or elk uh, i've always had a real fascination for hunting things that fly is this nice beautiful i mean it's quiet it, is, is, is there a solitude to this mm -hmm. is there something that you you could enjoy uh, uh having grown up and been confined to the restrictions of los angeles all your life <laughs> could you not enjoy this this is the other love of his sporting life hunting in the early morning sometimes on game days for eastern rough grouse or fishing on the backwater or some 5,000 miles from home on the Umba River in northern Russia with his close friend, Ted Williams. Tell me about what it was like to fish with Ted in Russia. Oh, it was the greatest. I called Ted and I say, how'd you like to go to Russia salmon fishing? And, you know, I really wasn't sure what to expect. And, and uh, uh, Ted says, uh, Russia? He said, what the hell do we want to go to Russia for? <laughs> And I said, there are a lot of salmon to catch. Are you going? Yeah, I'm going to go. Well, I'll go. And that was about all there was. And you've talked to him, and you know how. I mean, he's just great. Ted went, Ted went to the All-Star game that year. It was in Montreal. And he went with President Bush. And on the way to the All-Star game, Ted told me this story. The president says, well, Ted, what are you going to do the rest of the summer? And Ted said, well, in two weeks, I'm going to Russia fishing. And President Bush said, well, who are you going to Russia with? And Ted said, Coach Knight and I are going. And Ted said, the president just went, wow. <laughs> like, what's going to happen with these two in Russia? I, I think he is absolutely one of the greatest guys I ever met. I went to Russia with him, you know. He said he's a better fisherman than you are. Well, then he lied. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a good fisherman. He got to be, and he's got more staying power than any other fisherman I've ever went. <laughs> I said, you know, Bobby, I really love to fish with you. And I said, you're a good fisherman. You're getting better all the time. I'm trying to teach you everything I know. I give him a little dig. But I said, before I ever go fishing with you again, you got to tell me when you're going to come back, because, uh, geez, he'd stay all night. <laughs> he loves fishing. But see, fishing gives you, to me, the same thing this does. It gives you uh, a, a chance to see uh, what nature is all about. And, and, and to get involved with uh, just being outside and appreciate something that doesn't cost you anything. Night moves on the courts and in the wild are two different things. Uh, my record against the birds isn't very good. Nobody's is. I have uh, missed birds because I've been thinking about how we could defend the post or how we could play against the press. And all of a sudden, the bird gets up, and I say, what the hell was that? And, and I've missed it. Bird. Did you hit it? I think I missed that. <laughs> but what happens, I kind of laugh, and I actually tip my hat to all the pheasants that have gotten away <laughs> because they've been a lot smarter than I was. Bird. You got that one. <laughs> We're one and one today. That's it. When Up Close Prime Time continues, more with the one and only Bommy Down. The face is his face, the way he sits, the way he moves. The anguish, the exhilaration is different, but it is bloodlines on the sidelines. Patrick Knight is the youngest of Bob Knight's two sons. Once his father's player, he's now a coach for the Connecticut pride of the CBA. Basketball was the bond and the wedge between father and son. Patrick removes himself in part from being a son when he becomes a player. 
because now he becomes one of 12 kids or 13 kids that I've got as players. And I can't uh, have a, a different affection for Patrick as a player than I can for anybody else out there. Um, I never called him dad uh, once when I was there. I always called him coach. And, you know, I didn't go over his house during the season. He didn't come up and check on me. I mean, it's how the way it had to be to make it fair. Pat Knight never started Indiana, but he did make headlines when his father suspended him for public drunkenness. I knew it was coming. I mean, I knew right when I got, was sitting there in the drunk tank that I knew what was going to happen because that's how he's treated every player. I know he wasn't going to treat me any different. And the only hard part was going and having to tell him because he knew what he was going to say. And right there in front of me, he told me he was off the team, and he called the um, sports writer for the Herald Telephone and told him to put it front page of the paper that I was off the team. You picked up the phone, you called the newspaper, and you said, I want it on page one. Why? Some kid somewhere is going to see this and say, boy, what, a, what an opportunity Pat had. Now he screwed this thing up, and now what's going to happen? You know, I kind of have a reputation of being wild, and I, might, I still might have that reputation. But, you know, I think after that incident, I showed him that, you know, I can control myself off the court and that he doesn't have to worry about me, you know, when I'm off the basketball court. For, I think, 10 weeks, he had to go out and talk to schools in the area. And uh, I'll tell you what, he did it all on his own. And you know what he did? He had that, uh, that headline laminated <laughs> and took it in and passed it around the room where he was talking. Wow. And, and I thought, and he did all this on his own. And he said, you know, here I am, and here's what, and here, and, and he went on. And, and uh, the letters that I got back uh, from teachers uh, on Pat's presentation at grade schools or junior high schools uh, meant more to me than any championships we've ever won by far. He told you things you didn't want to hear that you needed to hear. And, uh, you know, you got mad at him at the time, but now you're away from it. You see, all he was doing was trying to make you a better player and a better person. But at the time, you think, geez, why is he on me? You know, you, you kind of, I mean, you hate him for it. That is an understatement. After all, wasn't it this incident that made it appear Bob Knight kicked his own son in the shins after a bad play? The coach says that never happened. I'm Pat. Uh, all right. As he sat down, he had his feet... Re and these chairs are a little bit, this isn't quite as wide as it, but as I, before I sat down, I kicked the chair, hit it with my foot, said, damn it, Pat, you can't throw it away like that. I mean, Pat's legs never move. If anybody ever took the time to have looked at this on a replay, and we will, see that Pat sits there exactly like he is. But perhaps one of the most revealing moments between father and son came when Bob Knight his voice choked full of emotion, introduced Patrick to the home crowd for the last time. Patrick Knight is my all-time favorite Indiana player. Uh, and as I introduced Pat, uh, I just said that he was my all-time favorite uh, Indiana player, and he was. You know, I wasn't prepared for that. You know, because I've never seen him be emotional. Um, I, the only way I've seen him be emotional is, you know, being angry. And I've never really seen him, you know, let down his guard like that. So it was really, you know, a special moment. Patrick Knight has a son's love of his father and a player's respect for his coach. But there's something more. And he found this quote to describe the most important man in his life. Theodore Roosevelt once said, it's not the critic, critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled, where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achieve achievements, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place should never be with those cold and timid souls, no neither defeat nor victory. By playing with them, all the IU players will never be a timid soul. He made us, you know, what we are. Dennis Rodman makes Titanic Thompson, Bobby Riggs, Barnum and Bailey all look like amateurs. <laughs> there is the greatest hustler that man has ever seen. <laughs> we'll be back at night as Up Close Prime Time. He is a study in contradiction. The disciplined man who sometimes loses control. The man of order and preparation who can respect a player who is a walking distraction. If you could ask Rodman any one question that you want to know, what would you ask him, Coach? I'd just say, 
tell me how much of this is honest and how much is bull <laughs> and, and, and I think if he were honest, he would say, Coach, you know how much of this is bull <laughs> you know. I think. And, and the other thing that, I, that is the way Rodman plays. I mean, he just plays like hell. He, he rebounds, he guards. He runs the floor. Uh, uh, he couldn't hit a ball in the ass with a ball bat. He can't shoot. But it violates but it violates your whole idea of discipline. Not the way he plays. Not the way he plays. But discipline. Not the way he plays. Coach. Not the way he plays. Dennis Rodman makes Titanic Thompson, Bobby Riggs, Barnum and Bailey all look like amateurs. <laughs> there is the greatest hustler that man has ever seen. He can ridicule a stranger and make him a friend. Tell me the story about this heavy set kid this was in the old uh, auditorium who, who once asked you said coach how do we get more people into the arena we need to go over to the assembly hall to get more people in there what did you say well I was a kid that I looked at he's about six four or five he's standing at a microphone there 3,500 4,000 students around him at this evening that we used to have and uh, I looked at the kid and said well if you'd get that fat ass the hell out of the doorway, a lot of more, a lot more people could get in a hell of a lot easier. Oh, that's brutal. About two days later, I get a letter from the kid about how embarrassed he felt he was, and I could relate to that. I could understand that, and and uh, in fact, I knew it as I'm saying it. But, but my, uh, I think that my willingness to to override his embarrassment and try to give the kid a message was maybe the only chance I'll ever have to see the kid. And so I track the kid down, I get him in here, and we put him on a program. Tim Garl, our trainer, arranged the program, and the kid lost 150 pounds. Bob Knight is the man who cut Charles Barkley from the 1984 Olympic team. But after about a week with this guy, I said, the man is a great coach, you can't take that from him, but he's not my kind of coach. He is definitely not my, my, my kind of coach. He was angry at you. No, he wasn't. cut him from the Olympics. No, no, he wasn't, Roy. He was angry with himself. Uh, Barkley didn't deserve to make the Olympic team. It seemed like he, he got a little emotional when he cut me. Like, he didn't come and say, Charles, you're cut. He says, well, you know, you did very well the first time you were here, and like, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, and, that, and I felt he felt some simple sense of sorrow when he cut me. Mm -hmm. and, and from that day on, I liked him. Bob Knight has seemingly unlikely support. The average person deals with average things. Bobby Knight is a champion. I'm a champion. When it's time to get after it, we get after it. And getting after it ain't easy. That's for sure. So you're talking about something that is going to be hard for a lot of people to understand. We're not looking for approval. It is what it is, and that's what it is. The fact is, Bob Knight defies stereotypes. He supported Robbie Alomar when no one else would. It was a moment where a guy just lost it in a highly competitive situation. Well, he's apologized, but people don't want to let him forget. Well, that's, that's their fault, not his. And years ago, when Woody Hayes hit the opposing team's player at the Gator Bowl, it was Bobby Knight who got Woody to apologize. My first attempt was to get Woody to write a letter to the boy, and then Woody called me at home one night, and he said, you know, Bobby, said, I don't want to write that letter. I don't, and I kind of anticipated that, and I said, no problem, Coach, here's his phone number. Mm. And he called the kid and talk to the kid and, and, and wish the kid well. And the only thing that ever got was a little blurb in the paper. Bob Knight, a man's man. Yet, how would he have done with two daughters? How would you like to be a guy coming to take out my daughter? <laughs> Think about that. I know. I mean, how would my daughter like to be... Knock on the door. My daughter Knock on the having door. her boyfriend Coach come Knight to Coach Knight is me. your daughter at home. That'd be rough. They, and, and I think that, that uh, every once in a while, you know, I know that there is a, an almighty presence in heaven. And, why, and why part that? of that evidence is not giving me daughters. <laughs> <laughs> he could be universally popular instead of highly controversial. But Knight says he won't play that game. It, it would be so much easier for you to, to round off the rough edges. You know, it would be easy it would seem like. Your, your life would be a lot easier, less controversy. Bob Knight's a great guy. He's the greatest coach, three-time national champion. It'd be so easy, it seems but like. You, but you know, I'm not unhappy with me. I like me. And yet, he has plenty of regrets. I wish that probably in a number of situations, I might have just been a little more tolerant than I was. 
not to change the outcome of what was done. And not to change who you are. No, not at all, but just maybe to have gone about something in a little easier way. In a moment, Memoirs of the General. They nickname him the General, but Bob Knight's military resume never made it higher than private first class. Yet there is something Knight has in common with this fictional character played by Jack Nicholson in the movie A Few Good Men. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I thought if any soliloquy, any little monologue ever was representative of the one person I've known in sports, it's Bob Knight and that scene. Tell me how that scene affected you. Well, uh, I think that Nicholson, though wrong, believed he was right, or believed he was right in doing what he did in that movie. And, and I really liked the way the movie finally ended, with, with Nicholson actually still true to his beliefs, but maybe having a broader understanding at the end than he did at any time during the movie. And, as I saw that, you're right, I could see some things, because you see, uh, I believe that it's necessary for me on occasion to go out on a limb. I've got to expose myself to whatever I'm exposed to to get the most out of this kid. Any uh, kind of embarrassment, whatever it takes. I think it's important for me to do whatever I humanly can do to get this kid to be the best he can be, period. And you related to the character because of the fact that he was loyal, first and foremost, to the code. Everything was the code. That was the phrase. You have a code here in Indiana. I mean, I'm not sure that everything I've done is right. I, I'm not sure that, that when I do something, it's, it's right. I, I, I played for a great coach in Fred Taylor, a great coach. And, and he never let a good play go by in practice that he didn't make mention of. Thanks, Gene. I don't care who made the play. It could have been a block out, a pass, uh, come up with a loose ball, whatever. And I've really tried to do that in my entire coaching career. But also, I want you to know when you've made mistakes. I don't think mistakes are a part of basketball. I don't think mistakes have to be a part of life. Winning is not making great plays. It's eliminating mistakes. Winning is eliminating poor judgment. It's, it's eliminating carelessness. It's eliminating a casual approach. It's, it's getting a kid to understand that if this is something he's doing, that others depend upon his doing it as well as he can do, that then, damn it, do it as well as you can do. I think if someone once would, would ask Bob Knight, ultimately, if he makes basketball players, then it would be apparent to me that what he would really say is, I don't make basketball players. I think I help make competitive men. I think I help make selfless men. I don't think that, that anybody makes a man. Uh, I hope that what I've done is help kids realize what it takes to become a man. What it takes to become a man who uh, not only contributes to society, but is a really worthwhile and a valued member of society. Joe Lapchick was one of Knight's greatest influences. Aside from being one of the winningest coaches ever, he asked Bob Knight one of the most important questions he'd ever been asked as a coach. How important is it to you to be liked? And I'd been the head coach at West Point for about two weeks. I'd never coached a game when he asked me that question. And I thought for a moment and I said, I said, coach, I said, I'd like to be respected for what I do, I don't have to be liked. And he said, if you have to be liked, don't coach. What is sacred to you? I think friendship. I think friendship is the most sacred thing of all. Uh, if you're my friend, what can I do for you? Uh, if you're my friend, uh, 
you have a problem, how can I help? If you're my friend, you've asked me to do something. If it's something that you need, I have to do it. Uh, I don't think that whether it's, it's in, I think friendship has to be sacred in marriage. I think it has to be sacred in a family. I think it has to be sacred in a team. I think it has to be sacred in life. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! That's another thing that's sacred to you. Probably as, as sacred as friendship is the truth. Yeah, the I truth. mean, uh, what, what, so I know people that, that would rather, rather uh, lie than tell the truth. And, and I know people that after a while begin to believe that, that the lie is the truth. I mean, I, I don't think that uh, there's anything that, uh, that I owe you more than to be truthful. Uh, if you ask me a question, and uh, I don't want to answer it. I simply say I don't want to answer it. So here uh, is the last question. What is the truth about Bob Knight? I don't want to answer it. <laughs> I knew that was good. I knew that was good. <laughs> I don't mind answering that because uh, uh, I'll tell you the truth. I, I think the truth about, about me is that, uh, that, that right or wrong, uh, I've tried to do what I think is best for all of the kids that have played for me. And I've been egotistical enough to know, or to think I know, that better than anyone else, I know what's best for them. And uh, obviously not always have I succeeded. But in far and away the vast majority of cases, I think I have, because there's not a coach in America that's prouder of the kids across the board that's played for him than I am. Demon, good deed doer, winner, and sometimes bad loser. All of those descriptions fit Bob Knight. Perhaps your opinions have changed of the man having seen this show. Perhaps they've only been reinforced. But either way, you have to admit, there's only one Bobby Knight. I'm Roy Firestone. Thanks for watching Up Close Primetime. Good night.